Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. I'm Nikki Spahich, Scientific Technical Editor for The Scientist, and I'll be moderating our discussion. Today, our speakers, Madhvi Menon and Jody Sheldon, will discuss immune profiling of COVID-19 patients and highlight the use of RNA scope in situ hybridization in SARS-CoV-2 research. We like our webinars to be interactive. We encourage you to send us your questions or comments at any point during the webinar, and the speakers will address these during the Q&A session following the presentation. To ask a question, simply click on the Q&A tab and type your query into the question box located on the right side of your screen. We'll try to address as many of these questions as we can during our Q&A session. The webinar will be archived on the Scientist website. We will send you the link via email within a couple of days. Please note that you will not be able to download the presentation slides. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank our webinar sponsor. ACD, a biotechnology brand, shortens the path to personalized medicine and enables research, drug development, and clinical applications by unlocking the power of RNA. ACD is a leader in the emerging field of molecular pathology, developing cell and tissue-based research and diagnostic tests for personalized medicine. Based in Silicon Valley, ACD was founded and managed by experienced entrepreneurs in the life science industry. ACD's products and pharma assay services are based on its proprietary RNA scope technology. With over 2,600 publications in six years, it's the first multiplex fluorescent and chromogenic in situ hybridization platform capable of detecting and quantifying single molecules of RNA in situ. ACD has two product lines, RNA scope and base scope, in addition to a pharma assay services business. The catalog includes over 10,000 target probes and assay kits for single, duplex, and multiplex RNA analysis. Our sponsors provided us with some helpful resources related to today's webinar, and we have posted these in our handout section located on the right side of your screen. You can access and download these documents at any time during the webinar. And with that, let me introduce our first speaker, Dr. Madhvi Menon. Dr. Menon is a Presidential Research Fellow at the University of Manchester, investigating mechanisms of B-cell dysfunction and chronic inflammatory disorders. Prior to this, she completed her postdoctoral studies at Harvard Medical School, identifying inflammatory pathways contributing to age-related macular degeneration, and at University College London, investigating how gut pathology contributes to the pathogenesis of rheumatoid arthritis. She obtained her PhD in immunology from University College London in 2015, studying the crosstalk between B cells and plasma satoid dendritic cells in systemic lupus erythematosus. Let's just make sure your slides are up and running. Okay, Madhvi, take it away. Thank you for the introduction. Hello, everyone. First of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for the invitation and this fantastic opportunity to share my work with you. Today, I will be presenting our work on the immune profiling of COVID-19 patients and discuss some distinct immune features we have found to be associated with disease pathogenesis. The work I'm presenting here today is the result of an enormous collaborative effort between immunologists at the University of Manchester, along with clinicians and research nurses at four different hospital sites in Greater Manchester. Our study is called the CIRCO study, which stands for the Coronavirus Immune Response and Clinical Outcomes Study. This study is being led by Professor Tracy Hussell, the director of the Lydia Becker Institute of Immunology and Inflammation at Manchester, along with five other colleagues, including myself, within the de department. The idea here was really to bring together our complementary immunology expertise to better understand mechanisms of immune dysregulation contributing to COVID-19 pathogenesis. For our study, we obtained peripheral blood samples from hospitalized patients at serial time points. So this is from the time of hospital admission all the way up until the time of discharge with samples being collected every one to two days during hospitalization. The blood samples collected 
We used to measure the levels of cytokines and chemokines in the serum using multiplex bead arrays, as well as to phenotype various immune cell subsets using flow cytometry. Amongst the different immune cell subsets, we primarily focused on monocytes, neutrophils, B cells, and T cells. In addition, we are currently sequencing the whole blood from our patient cohort to study the transcriptome as well as the B and T cell repertoire in COVID-19. One thing to point out is that all of the experiments here were performed real time, which allowed us the unique possibility to study dense granulocytes like neutrophils, which would not be possible using frozen bind cells. Patients within our cohort were classified with either mild, moderate or severe disease based on the amount of supplemental oxygen required to maintain target oxygen saturation. Patients classified as mild required less than 3 litres of oxygen, whereas moderate patients required between 3 and 10 litres. Severe COVID-19 patients required more than 10 litres of oxygen, were in intensive care and some of whom required ventilator support. For this study, we analysed a total of 73 patients cross-sectionally, 49 patients longitudinally and compared them to 31 healthy controls. The healthy controls within our cohort were mostly frontline workers and university staff as it was difficult to recruit healthy individuals during the peak of the pandemic and lockdown. When we started the study in early April, there was very little known about the dysregulated immune response in COVID-19 patients and the clinical management of disease. So there were really three questions we were most interested to ask. First, how does the immune response associate with the severity of COVID-19? This was to better understand the kinetics of the immune response in disease. Second, can we identify specific features of the immune response at hospital admission to predict the development of severe COVID-19? And third, are there specific immunologic parameters that track with patient recovery? To address these questions, we used flow cytometry to identify distinct immune populations and their activation at hospital admission. In this UMAP plot here, you can see the different peripheral immune cell subsets in a healthy individual, including granulocytes, monocytes, NK cells, B cells, and T cells. In our study, we focused on the four cell types highlighted in red. So when we compared these immune cell subsets to COVID-19 patients, we see that Whereas mild patients display an immune profile similar to healthy controls, patients with moderate and severe disease display an expansion of neutrophils and a reduction in majority of the other immune cell types. When we summarize this data, we see that there is a significant reduction in the frequencies of T cells and B cells in patients with severe COVID-19 at the time of hospital admission. In these graphs, severe patients are represented in black, moderates in blue, and milds in green. Interestingly, we see that the reduction in B and T cells is mirrored by an expansion of neutrophils in patients with severe disease. No major differences in monocytes were observed between patients and controls, and although I haven't shown the data here, NK cells and eosinophils were variable but not dramatically impacted. However, basophil and PDC frequencies were also decreased in patients with severe COVID-19. Next, we tracked the frequencies of immune cells over time to assess the kinetics of the immune response and its association with clinical outcomes. Here, we have plotted the frequencies of T cells and neutrophils against the days of reported symptoms with 
different colors indiv representing individual patients. What we can clearly see is that in these mild and moderate patients, the frequencies of T cells increase over time and reciprocally the frequencies of neutrophils decrease over time in majority of the patients. When we compare this to patients with severe disease that have recovered, we largely observe a similar response. The crossed squares here represent time points where patients were in ITU. When we then compare these results to severe patients that unfortunately had a poor outcome, we see that their T cell frequencies remain low and their neutrophil frequencies remain high. Both these patients represented here were critically unwell, with the patient in orange remaining in ITU for an extended period and the patient highlighted in red unfortunately passing away in hospital. So together, these data indicate that the restoration of T-cell and neutrophil populations is associated with a good clinical outcome. Moving on to B-cells, B-cells are known to play multiple roles in the immune response against pathogens. These include antibody production, antigen presentation to T-cells and IMK T-cells, as well as cytokine production. Similar to T-cells, B-cells can be classified as either the effector cells that produce pro-inflammatory cytokines such as IL-6 and TNF-alpha, or regulatory B cells that produce anti-inflammatory cytokines like RL10 and can suppress immune responses. First, we measure the frequency of antibody secreting cells or CD27 high, CD38 high plasma blasts in COVID-19 patients. We found that plasma blasts were significantly expanded in COVID-19 patients compared to controls However, they did not vary across disease severities. Although some patients displayed lower frequencies of plasma blasts at the time of hospitalization, majority of patients displayed expanded frequencies of plasma blasts at later time points. Interestingly, the plasma blast frequencies in COVID-19 patients correlated positively with IgG and IgA expressing B cells, but not IgM. This further supports an expansion of class-switched isotypes in COVID-19 patients as previously reported by other groups. In addition to plasma blasts, B cells can be broadly categorized into four major subsets based on the expression of IgD and CD27. These include naive B cells, unswitched memory B cells that express IgM, class switched memory B cells that express IgG, IgA, or IgE, and double negative memory B cells that are otherwise known as age associated B cells. As the name suggests, age associated or double negative memory B cells are expanded with age as well as in patients with chronic inflammatory diseases such as lupus. When comparing B-cell subsets between patients and controls, we observed a significant expansion of double negative memory B-cells in patients with severe COVID-19 compared to those with mild and moderate disease and controls. Other changes observed include a decrease in unswitched memory B-cells but no major changes were observed in switched memory cells or naive B cells at the time of hospitalization. B cells in the periphery can be further categorized as transitional and mature B cells based on their expression of CD24 and CD38. Within the naive B cell population is a subset of CD24 high, CD38 high transitional B cells which are known to be the precursors of immunosuppressive human regulatory B cells. Upon activation via toll-like receptor or CD40, these B cells produce IL-10 and suppress 
pro-inflammatory immune responses. In patients with severe COVID-19, we see a significant reduction in the frequency of transitional B-cells, and in contrast, mature B-cells that typically um, secrete increased RL6 are expanded in COVID-19 patients compared to controls. Next, we stimulated PDMCs in vitro via either Tolac receptor 9 or 7 with CPGC or RH48 respectively and measured the production of IL-10, IL-6 and TNF-alpha by B-cells. As you can see here, B-cells from COVID-19 patients produce significantly less IL-10 mirrored by an expansion of IL-6 in comparison to controls. No significant change in TNF-alpha production was observed in COVID-19 patients compared to controls. So together, these results suggest a shift in B-cell phenotype towards pro-inflammatory B-effector cells with an expansion of mature B-cells as well as IL-6-producing cells, mirrored by a reduction in immunosuppressive B-eggs, indicating a loss of immune regulation. So to summarize what I've shown you so far, we find that restoration of T-cell and neutrophil populations is associated with a good clinical outcome, and therefore the neutrophil to T-cell ratio could be used to predict disease severity. When assessing B-cell subsets, we observe an expansion of double negative memory B-cells and a decrease in transitional B-cells in patients with severe COVID-19. And finally, our findings suggest a shift towards pro-inflammatory B effector cell subsets and a reduction in IL-10 secreting regulatory B cells in COVID-19 patients that might be contributing to the hyperinflammation observed in disease. Next, we asked whether alterations in B and T lymphocytes are long-lasting and also observed in convalescent COVID-19 patients. The reason we were interested to investigate long-term responses is because some COVID-19 patients reportedly suffer from persistent symptoms commonly referred to as long COVID. These persistent symptoms include brain fog, breathlessness, hypertension, chronic fatigue, joint pain, etc., which often correlate with an unresolved chest x-ray. However, the long-term immune responses in these patients remain unknown. Therefore, to improve our understanding of long COVID, we assessed the phenotypic and functional characteristics of B and T cell lymphocytes in a cohort of 25 hospitalized COVID-19 patients compared to acute hospitalized patients and healthy controls. Convalescent patients within our cohort were all hospitalized patients between 8 to 19 weeks post-discharge. Interestingly, within our cohort, long COVID was not found to be associated with severity at the time of acute disease and hospitalization. When assessing CD19 positive B cell frequencies in the periphery, we found that these frequencies were normalized in convalescent COVID-19 patients. Interestingly, alterations in B cell subsets such as the double negative B cells and transitional B cells that were altered in acute severe disease were also recovered upon convalescence. Here, the representative TISNI plots showing the proportions of different B-cell subsets clearly indicate that alterations in B-cell subset frequencies observed in severe acute COVID-19 are indeed recovered in convalescent patients. I haven't shown the data here, but the recovery is irrespective of their disease severity at the time of hospitalization, as well as long-term clinical outcomes. The only B-cell subset 
that remained unchanged upon convalescence is the antibody secreting plasma blasts. We found that the frequencies of circulating plasma blasts were increased in convalescing COVID-19 patients compared to controls and that the expanded plasma blasts positively correlated with class-switched IgG and IgA isotypes, but not IgM. Next, we stimulated PBMCs with either CPG or RH48 for 48 hours to measure cytokine production by B cells. In these graphs, we stratify convalescing patients based on their chest X-rays as either normal X-rays or unresolved or abnormal chest X-rays. What we observed is that the reduction in frequency of IL-10 observed in acute patients appeared to be partly restored in convalescent COVID-19 patients with resolved or normal chest X-rays. However, this was not observed in patients with abnormal chest X-rays. As you can see within the normal chest X-ray group, there appear to be two distinct groups of patients based on their IL-10 production. However, these did not further stratify based on clinical outcomes or existing symptoms. In contrast to IL-10, IL-6 production by B-cells remained elevated in convalescent patients irrespective of normal or abnormal chest X-rays. Similar to acute disease, no significant changes in TNF-alpha expression by B-cells was, was observed upon convalescence. So together, these data suggest that whereas IL-10 is partly normalized in a subset of convalescent patients, IL-6 production remains elevated. For the sake of time, I will not be describing the long-term phenotypic alterations in T-cells from convalescent patients, but here we stimulate PBMCs with PMA, ionomycin and basaltin to assess the potential of T-cells in COVID-19 patients to secrete cytokines. As we can see, whereas IL-10-positive CD4 T-cells were expanded in acute COVID-19 patients, this was not observed in convalescent patients. In stark contrast, type 1 cytokines TNF-alpha and interferon gamma were not increased in acute disease, however, their expression was dramatically increased in convalescent patients particularly in patients with an abnormal chest X-ray. On the other hand, IL-17 expression <coughs> is increased in acute patients and remains elevated in convalescent patients irrespective of chest X-ray changes. Although not shown here, similar patterns were observed in cytokine-producing capacity of CD8-positive T-cells. In order to further probe lymphocyte changes within convalescent COVID-19 patients, we clustered patients based on their collective T and B cell features, including phenotype and function. As you can see here, unsupervised clustering based on lymphocyte features reveals three subgroups of convalescent patients with distinct T and B cell signatures. We next assessed whether these subgroups associate with clinical outcome, namely breathlessness and chest X-ray. In the red and grey heat map below the subgroups, red represents either abnormal chest X-ray in row 1 or reported breathlessness in row 2, whereas grey represents a good outcome. We found that group 1 displays high expression of trafficking molecules CXCR5 and CXCR3 reduced cytotoxic T cells and TH1 cells. Group 2 displays increased cytotoxic T cells, CD8 positive T effector membrane cells, and type 1 cytokine production by T cells. Group 3 expresses the highest frequency of IL-10 positive B cells, regulatory T cells, 
memory B cells as well as T effector, um, T follicular helper cells and plasmoblasts. Among the different subgroups, group 2 comprises the highest proportion of patients with an abnormal chest X-ray and reported breathlessness at their convalescent follow-up, whereas groups 1 and 3 have relatively good outcomes. These data support the existence of subgroups in convalescent COVID-19 patients based on long-lasting B and T cell phenotypes. Although this is a relatively small cohort of convalescent COVID-19 patients, Group 2 clearly associates with a worse outcome compared to Groups 1 and 3. Further investigation of these distinct immunotypes in a larger cohort of convalescent COVID-19 patients will help validate these findings and better understand how these subgroups associate with clinical outcomes. To summarize the second part of my talk, what I have shown you is that alterations in B-cell subsets are restored in convalescent COVID-19 patients, whereas IL-10 expression is restored in a subset of COVID-19 convalescent patients, IL-6 production by B-cells remains elevated, IL-17 and type 1 cytokine production by T-cells from convalescent patients are elevated compared to acute disease and controls. And finally, lymphocyte signatures identify three unique subgroups of convalescent patients. So going forward, we plan to maintain the circle structure to further investigate various aspects of the immune response in COVID-19 pathogenesis. For instance, we are currently investigating these novel patient subgroups based on lymphocyte signatures in a larger cohort of convalescent COVID-19 patients. We plan to evaluate longer term effects of SARS-CoV-2 infection on patient health, fatigue and depression up to one year and beyond. We intend to further investigate sustained changes in immune responses and their effects on subsequent infections, both in hospitalized patients as well as asymptomatic individuals in the community. And also uh, to maintain the structure for the flu season, a possible wave two or potentially a new coronavirus in the future. Finally, I'd like to thank all the immunologists at the University of Manchester, the clinical teams at Manchester Hospitals, the NIHR Respiratory TRC, PRC for their support, and most importantly to all the patients and healthy volunteers who contributed to the study, because none of this would be possible without their support. With that, I'll stop here. So thank you all for listening and I'll be happy to answer any questions at the end of the session. Thank you, Madhvi. As a reminder to our audience, you may submit your questions to Madhvi using the Q&A tab at any time. We will try to address as many questions as possible following our next speaker. Our next speaker is Jody Sheldon. Jody holds a master's in molecular and cell biology along with a bachelor's in dental surgery. She has previously worked in the field of genomics and precision diagnostics as a product specialist for qPCR-based liquid biopsy tests. She currently works as an associate scientist in ACD's application team to execute projects and collaborations that demonstrate novel applications of RNA scope and base scope technology. Let's make sure the slides are up and running. Okay, Jody, take it away. Thank you so much, Madhavi, for that great presentation. And uh, hello, everyone. My name is Jody Sheldon, and I work in the Applications Department at Advanced Cell Diagnostics. I'm going to be giving you a bit of an overview of RNA-scope technology in viral pathogenesis research with focus on COVID-19, um, given the interest of uh, the current pandemic. So let's look at how you can incorporate our highly sensitive and specific RNA-scope technology into your viral pathogenesis research. 
In this uh, webinar today, I'm going to go over the technology in general. Uh, I'm going to go over the applications in infectious diseases and then talk a little bit about our COVID-19 offerings and some of our early and latest publications. So what is the RNA scope technology? It is an ideal spatial analysis solution to interrogate complex tissues. So it's both highly specific and a sensitive method that allows you to detect RNA biomarkers in cells as well as tissues while giving you that morphological context and give, it, give that morphological context at a single cell level. Now the technology consists of three parts a unique target probe that ACD designs against your sequence of interest. It consists of a signal amplification system that generates a high signal to noise ratio. And lastly, visualization of single RNA molecules that you see as dots. The assay allows for spatial mapping of various types of RNAs such as mRNA, long non-coding RNAs, splice variants, and highly homologous sequences with both cells as well as in intact tissues. And you can visualize your data either as a fluorescent or a chromogenic label. Now this assay can be performed on a wide variety of sample types like FFPE tissues, fresh frozen, fixed frozen tissues. You can also visualize your data on PBMCs or cultured cells. That being said, for different types of um, mRNA types and different type of sample types, you may have to choose a specific platform of the RNA scope technology catered to your needs. So how do you get the high sensitivity and the specificity of the RNA scope technology? The two key features of the RNA scope technology are the probe design and the signal amplification. The oligonucleotide target specific probes are depicted as these Z's due to the fact that they have a spacer that is uh, that links these two regions. Now the bottom of the Z complements and hybridizes to the target transcript, while the top of the Z is the base for the amplification structure. So when you have both of these Z's hybridizing in tandem to your gene of interest, that creates a binding site on which this preamplifier can be built and the amplification tree can be built further. So as the Z's hybridize with the target RNA, the preamplifier binds to the top of the double Z pair. And now each of these preamplifiers can bind multiple amplifiers, and each of these amplifiers can further bind multiple label probes. These label probes can either be chromogenic or a fluorophore that generate a signal detectable under a standard right field microscope or a fluorescent microscope. Now, this signal amplification strategy yields high sensitivity and allows for visualization of target RNAs as a single dot, where each of these dot represents an individual RNA molecule. So how do we get high specificity? So background is eliminated because the signal is depending on both of these Z's binding right next to each other on the target sequence. So if you don't have both these Z's bind, but you only have one Z bind due to like, you know, a not to a non specific region, this amplification tree doesn't get built and you don't see a signal. And this is really important when you're working with samples such as FFPE, archival samples that have degraded RNA, in which traditional ish can give you a lot of non-specific binding. So this proprietary technology eliminates all that background in sample types like that. <clears throat> and so overall, you're really getting this high specificity and sensitivity from this assay. So what are our three unique assays that you can use for spatial mapping of gene expression? First falls under the umbrella that I talked about is the RNA scope assay, which uh, gives you about 20 Z pairs per target and single molecule detection. This can be most commonly used for targets such as mRNAs or long non-coding RNAs that are over 300 nucleotides and is available in either a single plex, duplex, or a multiplex format where you can multiplex up to 12 targets simultaneously. And you can do this either on an automated platform such as Leica or Ventana or a manual uh, assay. The second one is the base scope assay, and this gives you about one Z pair per target, or you can do up to three Z pairs. And this is most commonly used for targets such as splice variants, uh, short or highly homologous sequences, as well as point mutations. So anywhere between 50 to 300 nucleotides. And this can be used either a single plex assay or a duplex assay. And lastly, we recent, recently launched our micro RNA scope assay that allows for detection of ASOs, microRNAs, siRNAs, 
or smaller RNA sequences anywhere between 70 to 50 nucleotide. And this assay is currently available as a single-plex chromogenic assay, both on the automated as well as the manual platform. So with these three being our unique assays, so with all of those three unique assays, we do have a wide variety of product portfolio. As I mentioned before, we have RNA scope as single plex, duplex, or multiplex assays. Um, you can also do use the RNA scope hyplex assay that came out last year, where you can visualize up to 12 targets simultaneously on a single tissue section. For shorter targets, we have base scope singleplex or duplex, or for targets between 70 to 50 nucleotides, you can use our new microRNA scope assay. With all of these assays, we do have currently over 26,000 probes in catalog. And as long as you know your uh, sequence of the gene of interest, our probe design team can design uh, any target from any species in as little as two weeks. And this is really important, especially in the field of infectious disease research, where you need a probe fast for these novel uh, viral species or novel targets, where antibody development can take a longer time. So with that being said, why is the RNA scope assay ideal for viral detection, right? So let's start with the first thing, the context. The characteristic features of our technology enable researchers to overcome the various challenges that they face in detection of viruses. This assay can be used on various sample types, like I mentioned before, that allows for detection of any target while providing you that morphological information and viral localization, which is really important to see in viral pathogenesis research. So you can identify entry portals, you can look at replication sites or disease sites and therefore really understand the viral dynamics. The sensitivity of the assay, as I mentioned before, the pre-amplifier and the amplification tree system is built to enable high sensitivity and detection of targets that could probably have a low viremia. So you, it helps you detecting viruses at very early stages of infection, as well as in latent stages that present lower transcripts and that often present difficulties in detecting these viruses. So specificity, our patented ZZ technology provides high specificity for this assay. And this really helps you discern closely related viral species. So when closely related viral species have high homology, this double Z technology really helps you overcome that non-specific binding. And as I mentioned before, as long as you know your sequence, we can design probes for any species. The design process is rapid and it serves as a user advantage, as I said, for emerging viruses. The probes can be designed single-stranded and can be made strand-specific to discern various viral stages with hybridization to both the sense as well as the antisense strands that allows you to look at both the resting stages as well as the replication, replicating stage of the uh, virus on the same tissue context, really giving you this broad understanding and the overall mechanism of action and the dynamics of the virus in the host's body. <clears throat> so RNA scope has the ability to detect a wide range of viral species such as DNA viruses, RNA viruses, retrotranscribing viruses, we're going to focus today on RNA viruses, but of course, you can go visit our website and get details on probes on all the other viral species as well. So now I'm going to give some examples of how RNA scope was used in infectious disease research with focus on viruses other than COVID-19. Nipah virus is a negative sense RNA virus, and it was emerging back in the day and it was highly lethal zoonotic virus that caused severe brain encephalitis. Now in the May 2018 Nipah virus outbreak in India, the fatality rate was almost 91%. And of those humans that did survive, relapsing encephalitis occurred in a lot of those patients. So in this particular study from US Amrit, Researchers from Kevin Zeng's lab investigated the potential for persistence of Nipah virus infections of non-human primate survivors. Now, they used our RNA scope chromogenic-ish assay to detect Nipah virus in non-human primate species or tissues. 
Chromogenic assay revealed that only the brains of the survivors showed the presence of the viral RNA. The multiplex fluorescent assay, on the other hand, confirmed both the presence of the positive antisense as well as the negative sense strand of Nipah virus. And detection of these positive and negative viral RNA indicated that active Nipah virus replication, demonstrating the persistence of this virus in the brain of non-human primate survivors with previous Nipah virus infection. As you can see here, it's really highlighting the power of RNA scope in looking at viral persistence, an area that is very widely studied in infectious disease research. Rift Valley fever virus, or RVFV, it is known to cause severe disease in livestock concurrent with zoonotic transmission to humans. A subset of people that were infected with RVFV developed encephalitis as well. But knowledge of how this was caused, the, in the, or the pathology in brain was very limited back in the day. So in this paper, researchers from University of Pittsburgh found that neutrophils and macrophages were the major cell types to infiltrate the uh, central nervous system following infection with this Rift Valley virus. They performed dual RNA scope ish NIF, where they looked at RNA and protein simultaneously, along with staining from neurotrace to visualize the RVFV infection and the inflammatory response in the rat brain. This particular dual ish RNA scope workflow allows you to look at both RNA and protein in the same tissue context by performing sequential RNA and protein detection. We did recently launch a new workflow called Detection Workflow that allows you to ena or enables you to use a lot more antibodies with respect to our previous workflow and allows you for simultaneous detection of RNA and protein on the same tissue section. If you'd like more information on that, you can visit our website to look at our co-detection workflow and applications of that workflow. So now let's look at more examples of positive single-stranded RNA viruses. This is a paper from Erasmus Medical Center. The MERS-CoV-2 infection, which is also under, falls under the family of coronavirus, was known to cause outbreak in humans that was fueled by the introduction of the virus from dro dromedary camels. <clears throat> Now, scientists from Albert Osterhaus Group, they showed a viral vaccine, MVAS, that confers mucosal immunity in these camels. So they used the RNA scope homogenic red assay and detected the efficiency of this vaccine. So they saw that post-vaccination, as you can see, there was a significant reduction in the signal of the Morse cove RNA in the nose of the camels compared to the control groups. They also performed ish and IXC on a serial section to compare the antigen and the RNA levels. This is another area in infectious disease research where RNA scope is used a lot, is to uh, study the eff efficiency of vaccines in animal models, basically comparing signal in the tissue pre-vaccination versus post-vaccination. <clears throat> Here is example of Zika virus where scientists from Washington University St. Louis evaluated Zika viral eye infection using a mouse model of Zika viral pathogenesis. Now, mouse models were ideal for studying Zika virus induced ocular diseases. It allowed researchers to define the mechanism of viral persistence and therefore further develop therapies for viral eye infections. Now, they used the arniscope chromogenic ish assay in brown to detect the Zika virus RNA viral burden in the eye of these immunocompetent neonatal mouse models. As you can see, RNA dots was visualized in a well-defined manner across the corneal layer, the optical nerve, and the bipolar ganglion layers of the retina as seen in these images. Here is another example of Zika virus where it was associated with congenital microcephaly and therefore further associated with loss of pregnancy. Transmission of virus in pregnancy is another area in infectious diseases that is studied a lot, and I'll show you some examples of that with COVID later on. The mechanism of Zika virus in uterine trans intrauterine transmission, its replication, tropism, and persistence was poorly unknown. Therefore, in this paper, Patnagar and researchers from CDC used the RNA-scope chromogenic red assay to localize 
both the replicating strand as well as the viral strand in brains of infants and placentas of women with pregnancy loss. And they demonstrated that the viral infection replicated and persisted in fetal brains and placentas, further showing its association with congenital microcephaly. Now let's look at the COVID-19 offerings provided by ACT and how RNA-Scope can further your COVID-19 research. <clears throat> RNA-Scope provides a lot of product offerings across the entire COVID-19 viral pathogenesis research, starting from detecting the virus alone. You can use our singleplex assays to look at the virus in the tissue context, or you can use our duplex assays to understand the interaction between the virus and the receptors. In addition, our multiplex assays allow you to expand your targets to not only now look at the virus receptor, but also look at this immune response or also known as the cytokine storm that is associated with COVID-19 infection. In addition, our multiplex assays also enable you to look at the histopathological markers that are associated with COVID-19 infection really giving you this broader understanding and bigger picture of the viral pathogenesis. But with that specificity, the sensitivity, and that morphological context at a single cell level. Really, really powerful. Now, our COVID-19 probe is the VNCOV 2019S probe uh, and is available to target the coronavirus outbreak that happened in Wuhan, China, as you all know about. It specifically detects the spike S protein of the novel coronavirus and was designed such that it avoids cross detection with the previous SARS species, the MERS species, and the other coronavirus species. As I mentioned, our unique probe design strategy allows you to really discern between these closely related species and distinguish between highly homologous sequences. We, you can use it across a variety of animal models, such as the human, mouse, rat, monkey, uh, potential natural hosts, ferret, bat, but also we can design probes for any species as long as the sequence is known. And you can use it to study localization and infiltration of the virus in the tissue. Some of the commonly available probes uh, for different markers that ACD has already provided in the catalog based on early literature are probes for viral detection. Uh, is the SARS-CoV-2 and the SARS-CoV-2 sense that allows you to look at both the viral strand as well as the replicating strand. The host cell markers, as we read from some early papers that were commonly being studied, were ACE2, TIMPRS2, and catepsin. Some inflammatory response markers, as I mentioned before, COVID-19 was known to uh, follow up with this cytokine storm that researchers studied. So uh, we have probes for all these interleukin markers, TNF-alpha, and some histopathological markers, which was really important to look, especially in the lung, uh, immediately after COVID-19 infection, such as aquaforin-5, RAGE, uh, CC16, and KL6. So these markers are already available in our catalog for you to purchase uh, to enable your COVID-19 research. In addition to these markers, as I mentioned before, you can also perform RNA scope along with IHC or IF if you have an antibody that you are trying to use for COVID-19 research. With our new co-detection workflow, you can look at both the RNA target as well as the protein target on the same tissue context. These are just some examples of potential combinations. If you already have a protein antibody for ACE2, you can combine it with our SARS-CoV-2-ish probe uh, and look at both of them on the same tissue context. <clears throat> so th these are some main applications of RNA scope in COVID-19 literature. I already showed you some examples of this previously in other infectious disease areas, but now I'd like to focus more on how researchers are using RNA scope specifically in COVID-19 research. So these are the four main areas. They're either looking at cell or tissue tropism. Uh, they're using RNA scope to understand natural immunity. They're using RNA scope to look into vaccine development, as I mentioned before, study the efficiency of vaccine 
as well as in understanding placental transmission. And I'm going to show you a few examples of publications uh, in COVID-19 research area. Now, this first one is a paper that looks at an, or it looks into understanding protective immunity to SARS-CoV-2. And this is very critical for vaccine and public health strategies that are aimed to end this global pandemic. A key and answered question is whether infection with this virus, the SARS-CoV-2, results in a protective immunity against re-exposure. So in this paper, scientists from Harvard Medical School, they developed a rhesus macaque model for SARS-CoV-2 to study the pathological and immunolog immunological findings of COVID-19. They also used this model to study the natural immunity against SARS-CoV-2 after re-exposure. Arniscope chromogenic red assay was used to visualize both the SARS-CoV-2 viral strand as well as its replicating intermediate in lung tissue, as you can see on the screen. In addition, they also performed IHC staining for cytokeratin and the viral nucleocapsid protein from Novus to indicate the infection in alveolar epithelial cells. In summary, all of this information can further be used for testing vaccines against the virus and for development of therapeutics for COVID-19. This second example is a recent paper that came out in the study of the Moderna vaccine, the mRNA-1273. The effect of this SARS-CoV-2 vaccine on viral replication in both the upper and the lower airway is important to evaluate in non-human primate species uh, during its development process. So in this paper, researchers evaluated this Moderna vaccine that was is now in clinical trials for an, that is specifically encoding the spike protein of the SARS-CoV-2 probe in non-human primates. And they detected the viral load in lung tissue after uh, vaccination. As you can see, compared to the control group, they saw a significant decrease in inflammation on administration of this vaccine at both 10 micrograms as well as 100 microgram, and really shows the or highlights the importance of using RNA scope in vaccine development to study the efficiency of these vaccines and looking at the actual tissue based expression of this uh, viral disease before and after vaccination. <clears throat> this is a paper that came out of University of North Carolina from the Barrick Lab. The mode of acquisition and causes for the variable clinical spectrum of the COVID-19 disease uh, remains unknown, as you may all have seen in newspapers or in news that different people are responding in a very spectrum of uh, clinical symptoms to this COVID-19 infection. So this researcher really wanted to understand this, this variability in this clinical spectrum of this disease. And so they used a reverse genetic system to study the SARS-CoV-2 growth and pathogenesis. Using the RNA scope cytospin technology, they revealed ACE2 expression in upper respiratory tract with increased sensitivity and efficacy compared to single cell RNA sequencing. Additionally, using the RNA scope red assay, they established an ACE2 expression gradient in the respiratory tract and detected Timpris 2 in the normal, normal human surface uh, airway epithelium. To gain insight into pathways that may contribute to dysregulation of this ACE2 expression in uh, patients that have pre-existing cystic fibrosis, they also tested the effects of selected cytokines on ACE2 expression in the large airway epithelial cultures. And they saw that the interleukin 1b, the dominant promucin secretory cytokine in cystic fibrosis, uh, upregulated ACE2, but it did not upregulate TIMPRES2. So also understanding the role of this infection, the SARS-CoV-2 infection, in patients with pre-existing conditions. <clears throat> this paper came out of US Android, where scientists wanted to identify and evaluate commercially available reagents and assays for molecular detection of SARS-CoV-2. And they used both our chromogenic as well as the fluorescent assay to look at both the viral strand as well as the replicating strand. And you can really see the specificity and sensitivity of this assay in detecting the virus in these infected African green monkey kidney cells. 
Uh, in addition, they also perform the simultaneous RNA scope ish and IHC detection for the SARS CoV 2 and again show the specificity of the assay if you compare uninfected to infected tissue, really highlighting again uh, the importance of this co detection workflow. <laughs> Um, this was a paper that came out of Medical Center of Hamburg, and you're there trying to look at uh, organotropism of COVID-19. So they looked, they detected the SARS-CoV-2 viral RNA in PCR-positive FFPE lung and renal parenchyma samples, and they revealed that SARS-CoV-2 had an organotropism and can affect other organs in addition to lungs, thereby potentially aggravating patients with pre-existing conditions. Uh, this is an example of RNA scope in uh, studying placental transmission. When I talked about constantly studying this infection in pregnant women, in this particular study, they looked at two cases of SARS-CoV-2 PCR positive mother, neonate, and plus, uh, placenta, and they used our LICA assay to look at the SARS-CoV-2 viral strain in placental tissue and evaluate its tissue distribution, therefore validating the presence of this uh, viral RNA in infected placentas and possibly supporting vertical transmission of SARS-CoV-2 from mother to baby in utero. And lastly, uh, this is an image from Arcana Labs and Yale School of Medicine, where researchers presented a case of COVID-19 positive patient in her second trimester. And this patient had a complication by severe preeclampsia and placental abruption. So they used the SARS-CoV-2 brown assay to visualize the RNA in the placental tissue. Uh, and they wanted to basically distinguish the physiological effects of preeclampsia and COVID-19 so doctors have a better prognosis for pregnancy. Once again, showing the application in studying placental transmission. So with all of these publications, we do have a lot more publications. This list is available on our website for you to view if interested. And with all of these publications, I also wanted to highlight that the growth and adoption of this technology is best exemplified by our number of peer-reviewed publications. Since 2011, uh, where we started with just four publications, we are now over 2,900 publications with some of the top areas being cancer, neuroscience, infectious diseases, stem cells, but you can really apply this technology in any research area. So with all of this, I hope I've convinced you today that RNAscope uses a unique probe design strategy to dramatically improve signal to noise ratio. And we have currently over 22,000 probes on catalog. We current, uh, with our high sensitivity and specificity, uh, you can get both quantitative and spatial information on your targets in complex tissue environment at that single cell resolution. Our assays such as base scope and micro scope assay allow you to detect targets with short sequences down to almost 17 nucleotides. And using our HIHC workflow, you can simultaneously detect RNA and protein on the same tissue section, really giving you the power to your data. So if you have any other questions, please feel free to contact either me or our support team, uh, as you can see on the screen. You can also visit our website uh, at www.acdbio.com. And please uh, feel free to attend our upcoming webinars where you can get information for RNA scope in other areas of research. Thank you so much for attending. Uh, stay healthy, stay safe, and I believe we will take your questions now. Thank you. Thank you, Jody. Our audience has submitted several questions, so let's get to them. Uh, this first one is for Madvi. Do you have any plans in the future to use RNA in situ hybridization in any of your COVID-19 studies? Yes, so we absolutely do. We haven't yet used RNA scope for in situ hybridization due to lack of access to human tissues, but um, that is definitely in the works. And once we have access, that is something we'd like to do because we'd like to look at viral load and compare that to infiltrating lymphocytes and other immune cell subsets at the in various tissue locations, and um, also look in animal models of SARS-CoV-2 infection. Great, thank you. This next question is for Jody. Does the COVID-19 probe detect other SARS species? Uh, yeah, so that's a great question. Uh, as I mentioned in the presentation, 
It really depends on you. Uh, the SARS-CoV-2 probe uh, that we showed that is specifically detecting the spike as protein for the current COVID-19 virus uh, does not cross detect in the other coronavirus families. Um, and that's where you really see the specificity of our, of our probes. But that being said, if you did want to design a probe that uh, detected the overall or the general COVID-19 family or the COVID family, you could work with our probe design team and design a probe for that as well. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Madhvi, this is a bit of a two-part question. How long after the onset of symptoms um, is it before you consider a patient convalescent? And what would be the consequences of long-term alterations in lymphocytes in that population? Right. So uh, to answer the first question, we consider patients convalescent once they are, so it, within our cohort, we looked at patients between eight and 19 weeks post hospital discharge. So that's typically between five and six months prior to uh, after onset of uh, initial symptoms. And the second part of your question in terms of long-term lymphocyte alterations, uh, one of the things I showed was that in, within the different subgroups we identified of convalescent patients, uh, the group two, which had highly activated T cells with increased cytokine production and cytotoxic cells, appear to be associated with a worse clinical outcome. So one possible um, explanation for this is that these could in fact be activated memory cells that are in fact primed to rapidly clear any subsequent infections. However, what this means in terms of long-term chronic inflammation remains to be seen. And um, I should point out that our findings are in a small cohort of convalescent patients. So these findings certainly need to be validated in, within a larger cohort. And in addition, something we are looking at doing is following these patients up to one year and then two years to see how long these alterations persist and how they correspond to uh, long-lasting symptoms. Thank you. Jody. what markers do you recommend for primary testing of SARS-positive tissue? Um, so in terms of recommendations of markers, we always, uh, we, we provide you some recommendations based on literature, but it's always suggested that the researcher use, you know, their, uh, the, their needs for the project and their uh, requirements to choose those. Um, but in general, for early COVID-19 research, based on some early literature, we, uh, we have provided these probe sets for COVID-19 detection in various uh, species. And you can find them on our website that consists of markers for the viral detection, um, the detection of the receptors, and some uh, immune markers. So you can, uh, you can go on the COVID-19 webpage and find these probe sets that are already uh, bundled together for researchers to start their experiments, if that helps. Great, thank you. Madhvi, can you tell us a little more about the double negative memory B cells that are expanded in COVID-19? Yes, so the double negative memory B cells are a heterogeneous, quite a heterogeneous B cell subset, which are known to be expanded in infections as well as chronic inflammatory diseases. So for instance, in patients with lupus, these are thought to be uh, co comprising of extra follicular B cells that secrete antibodies and pro-inflammatory cytokines rapidly in response to TLR activation. In contrast, in patients with HIV, this subset is thought to comprise of um, B cells with an exhaustive phenotype that in turn promote T cell exhaustion. So I think overall their role in COVID-19 remains to be ascertained and um, the functional consequences of their expansion in patients with severe COVID-19 requires further investigation. And this is something we're working on at the moment. Great, thank you. Jody. Can you elaborate more on the HyPlex assay and how it can be used in COVID-19 research? Sure, so the HyPlex assay came out last year that allows customers for detecting up to 12 simultaneous target on a tissue section. Um, for COVID-19 research, uh, it is important to note that the HyPlex assay is 
currently optimized only on fresh frozen tissue sections. So a lot of the customers that are uh, using COVID-19 um, you know, uh, tissue samples, you would have to work with our support team to make sure that your samples are collected and prepared um, in, the, in the right way that makes it easier to run this uh, format. Um, you run it in three iterative rounds of four targets each, um, and then you use our image registration software that allows you to um, basically overlap and register these uh, images from the three rounds together and look at your data um, by turning on and off your targets of interest and using pseudo colors. So it really gives a lot of power to a researcher that wants to look at more than four targets. And uh, also with COVID-19, where your samples are really precious, uh, that assay uh, truly helps. <clears throat> Thank you. Can I, just, can I just add something to what Jyoti yes. just said? Yes, so please. I just want to say that I have actually used this technology from RNA scope and it works incredibly well. So we use these with human retinal tissues uh, during my postdoc at Harvard Medical School. And uh, it just the staining is beautiful. It was really straightforward. And at the moment, we're actually trying to use Hyplex to study um, lung tissues in patients with COPD. So th this works incredibly well. Great, thank you. Madhvi, do the B and T cell responses vary based on age or, or sex? So with the B cell responses, within our patient cohort, we have not observed any differences based on age or gender. Now with the double negative B cells, they're typically expanded with age. So they're otherwise known as age associated B cells. However, the expansion we observe in patients with severe COVID-19 was independent of age. And this was the same with gender. When looking at T cell responses, however, there's definitely increased T cell activation and production of type 1 cytokines by in females compared to males. And the same goes for the, uh, for the expansion of cytotoxic T cells. But this work, ha this has been previously published in a beautiful study by uh, Akiko Iwasaki from Yale School of Medicine. So but we observe the same within our patient cohort as well. Great. And now we have time for just one more question. Madhvi, have you measured antigen-specific antibody responses in COVID-19 patients? Yes, so I didn't have time to show you the data today, but we have measured the levels of circulating immunoglobulins to uh, spike protein in patients. What we uh, briefly, so what we see is that these antibodies are developed in patients between one and two weeks post onset of symptoms. And in two of the patients that failed to develop the, any antibodies over the course of disease uh, ended up with a poor outcome. So one patient, for instance, was B cell depleted, so lacked B cells after treatment with rituximab. And this uh, patient, unfortunately, has ha continues to have persistent symptoms for almost, I think, four months now. And another patient, sadly, died in hospital uh, due to complications from COVID-19. So this clearly highlights the importance of antigen-specific antibodies to effectively clear the virus. Great, thank you. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. If you have any further questions, please consider reaching out to the speakers directly. Their email addresses are shown on the screen. As a reminder, the webinar will be archived on the Scientist website, and you'll receive an email notifying you when the on-demand webinar is available. I would like to thank everyone who took the time to join us today, and particularly those of you who shared your questions and comments. On behalf of the Scientist, I'd also like to thank our speakers, Dr. Madhvi Manan and Ms. Jody Sheldon, as well as our sponsor, ACD. Thanks everyone and goodbye.